Hi, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, explore butterfly habitats, migration patterns, and what affects populations with experts from the National Butterfly Center in Mission, Texas. On Tor and Kyle, see how a gardener created her wildlife habitat in a small garden. Daphne makes her pick of the week, and Trisha makes Icebox pickles. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Is it possible to create a wildlife habitat in a small yard with neighborhood restrictions? Yes, you can, just like this gardener and Kyle. When Ida Bouillon moved to her new home, she wanted to downsize her garden and be closer to her intensive hours job. I had a house over in, in the Dripping Springs area at an acre and a half, and I couldn't keep up with it. There was no way. As a master naturalist and habitat steward, she went for native plants. Luckily, she had open ground for her selections. It was dirt when I bought it. Her HOA requires some lawn, but Ida whittled it to the minimum percentage in favor of mixed heights that support indigenous wildlife. She also chose plants that hang on in drought. I had 100% natives up until last fall, and I, and I wanted to plant roses when I first moved here, but I made a commitment to just plant natives because I wanted to show that you can have a lovely yard with just natives. And people walk by in the various different stages of evolution of the yard and they say, oh, it's, you know, it's so pretty, you know, it's really nice. And I say, and it's all natives. In the alleyway side, frog fruit carpets the ground under taller wildlife promoters. Frog fruit flowers attract multiple pollinators. Its leaves provide larval food for several butterflies. I like the diversity. I like seeing a lot of different things. I like the butterflies and the hummingbirds that native ones that come here with the native plants. Eventually, Ida did bring in roses, but she selected hardy Texas superstar knockouts. It's like those favorite things you have. Ida doesn't give them any more care than their native companions. In the side yard, zoysia grass fulfills the turf requirement. To gently enclose this destination, Ida set up trellises that permit interaction with strolling neighbors. To embellish the trellises with vivid summer color, she went outside her native box with mandevillas that attract pollinators and hummingbirds. For rainfall catchment, she built a retaining wall with interlocking blocks. All plants, even natives, require water. Since needs vary, pair compatible specimens. Soil type and drainage matter too. So to, to uh, understand the requirements of the plants and put them in the right place, sun, shade, the kind of soil, does it need good drainage? Like I have a part that's a slope there so I can put in some um, plants that need good drainage, even though my soils are a little bit clay on the clay side, but it has good drainage. Maintaining a healthy environment um, I guess it's kind of like people. If you if you maintain yourself in a healthy way and you eat well, you're going to be healthy. And if you and and if you allow yourself to get stressed and not sleep enough and not you know, eat well, you're more likely to get sick. So by maintaining a healthy environment, which means you've got the soil that the plants like, you've got the amount of rain and when the rainfall is that the plants thrive on, you've got the temperatures that the plants like, then you're going to have a healthy yard. Outside the back door, she rejected turf in this tiny spot. Instead, she built a patio of unmortared brick. Ida shields the fence with shrubby plants and understory perennials. A wild grapevine softens the lines of the house. At the street side of the house, Ida planned ongoing habitat diversity. She hasn't watered established plants for five years. In front, she blended textures, height, and plants that flower and bury. But even with wildlife food sources like native Barbados cherry, 
it's important to know what conditions suit each plant. The natives, although they so, do so well here, um, you have to understand that some like drier soil, some like moister soil. If it's in the sun, you can water it more than if it has more shade. So you can't just say, oh, I like this plant, oh, I'll just stick it anywhere and expect it to grow. Aside from the wildlife habitat she's created, Ida's cut down on her garden workload. An afternoon a few times a year to prune replaces weekly mowing and edging. But the rewards keep on coming. Now the thing with the natives is they don't all bloom and show up at the same time, but through the year, you see the great variety of plants, little ones, and those tiny ones, and then, then you know, and then of course the trees, you know, too. But uh, the diversity is phenomenal. And diversity is what keeps the habitat and the yard healthy. This is so maintenance free, so low budget, it's incredible. I wanted to show that it could be done. All right, thanks for sharing your garden with us. We're going to move from a butterfly garden to a butterfly center. I'm joined by a couple of folks from Mission, Texas, to talk about the National Butterfly Center. And it's, this is going to be a real treat, folks. I think you're in for something special. Thanks so much for being here. Thank we you. have Mariana Tr Trevino Wright, who's the executive director of the National Butterfly Center, and Max Munoz, who's the guy who takes care of the center. He's the manager of the grounds. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's, oh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, tell me about the center. You've been around for a number of years. I'm just learning about it, though. Well, the National Butterfly Center is a project of the North American Butterfly Association. Okay. And they chose Mission, Texas for its prime location. It is uh, home to more species, the lower Rio Grande Valley is, more species of butterflies than anywhere else in the United States anywhere else in North America. The center's been there for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. and we have a beautiful visitor's pavilion that um, will be three years old in the fall. Okay, mm -hmm. so a national center in Mission, Texas. Uh, and I know that uh, people already travel from all over the world to come to the Rio Grande Valley to see birds, so this seems like a, a beautiful compliment. It really is, and, and the birds come through the central U.S. flyway, mm -hmm. which, of course, we're at the tip of. And what's the number one food for your migratory songbirds? Hmm, let me guess. <laughs> Caterpillars and right, butterflies. Right, right, so, of right. course, they're following the food trail. Oh, interesting, very mm -hmm. interesting. So, uh, and the, actually, the migratory... And um, many butterfly species are migratory, right, Max? Correct, yes. You will find a whole lot of them there and coming from many different places, north and south. Right, okay, so many of the species, again, are migratory, so the birds are following those there. Yeah. But a real special treat for people uh, who love butterflies and are uh, from more northerly parts of the United States, there are lots of endemic uh, tropical species there, right? There are. Of the 700 species of butterflies in North America, about 300 of those species can be found in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Okay. And over 200 of those species have been photographed and identified at the National Butterfly Center on our 100 acres. Okay, now there's some really special critters here that, and I know I've seen a handful of these in the past. But uh, there are some remarkable species. And I want to let's just give people a little taste of some of the the exotics, if you will, the okay. ones that uh, you will only find in the lower Rio Grande Valley. There's a species that uh, I was looking at some images and a, a clear winged clear butterfly. Wings. That is a tropical butterfly. Mm -hmm. That is one butterfly you will not find in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, we have other ones. Uh, one, one of our special ones is um, malachite, for mm -hmm. example. That is one also that you'll see in the lower Rio Grande Valley, mm -hmm. and another one that you won't see up, you know, north of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the malachite is, and this is an interesting species, really colorful and a big species too, right? It is a very large brush foot, like a monarch. So mm -hmm. it's going to be about a four-inch butterfly. Okay. And it's green and black instead of orange and black. Okay. And it's a woodland butterfly, so it's perfectly camouflaged. Okay. Hide out in the hackberries down it there does. in South Texas, right? It does. Okay. And uh, the the clear wing obviously lives up to its name, and uh, uh, really remarkable. I, I, I guess this is camouflage at its ultimate, in a way. A transparent butterfly, yes. Or stealth butterfly, <laughs> <laughs> right? It is, but we, you know, with our 
our place in the there near the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. and the way the winds and the tropical storms blow and all, mm -hmm. we do when we get southern winds, we get these subtropical and tropical species that have right. maybe been blown off course like the Orion Cecropian and the Guatemalan crackers. So there are lots of really cool butterflies that you can't find anywhere else uh, other than going maybe to those countries or to the tropics, Central right. America. Well, I will say that uh, I've had some beautiful experiences looking at butterflies in my life, but uh, none more beautiful than spending time in the lower Rio Grande Valley during the migration season. You can drive through literally clouds of yes. these guys. <laughs> or pull over and not uh, drive uh, through uh, them. Yeah, the, <laughs> preferably, <laughs> yes. So, but uh, uh, just amazing and, uh, and there's so much that we can do to help these migrants migrators too and then we all want to spend some time talking about that. Let's talk about the migrators now because there's some perils involved in migration that we want to really focus in on but lots of species of course the monarchs right? The monarchs, the swallowtails, the sulfurs, um, the American snouts, which mm -hmm. are very, very common, mm -hmm. buckeyes. There are many species that migrate south because butterflies are cold-blooded species. Mm -hmm. So they need uh, sun and heat to uh, have the energy they need to feed and to breed. Right. Now, Max, I, w I was surprised to learn this, but uh, butterflies don't just migrate back, say, for example, the famous example of the monarchs, they don't fly all the way from Mexico to the United States and then back. <laughs> it takes generations. It does. Um, the monarch will, take, let's say, just take off from Canada, arrive in, uh, say, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. They lay their eggs there on a milkweed plant, and uh, once the caterpillar hatches and turns into a butterfly, it takes off from there. Mm -hmm. They have their own little GPS system, which I don't <laughs> understand yet, but they have their own. So uh, you get somebody hopping from New, New Jersey to North Carolina or et cetera, it just kind of mm -hmm. take hops by the generation. Mm -hmm. they That's do. fascinating. Now, um, a lot of people are concerned about butterfly populations, particularly those that are migrating through the United States right now, because they, in many ways they're an indicator species, right? They are. They're a very sensitive environmental indicator to the health of our, of our flora, of our plants. Mm -hmm. And you know we've had drought for many years in the United States. One of the devastating consequences of drought and development is the disappearance of native plant species. Sure, sure. So when the plants disappear, the butterflies, really there's no food source and, and they're stuck in a very real way. Are, are we seeing declining populations? We're seeing reports of declines and mm -hmm. you know every year the North American Butterfly Association conducts counts three mm -hmm. times a year and these are open to uh, enthusiasts and naturalists to participate. You can find your counts on the NABA website, okay. join those and they're collecting data. How many butterflies, how many species, how many of each, of each species to try to gather enough data to ascertain patterns and cause is, whether it's climate, development, mm -hmm. seasonal issues, and uh, really there is some science behind it, but I don't know that anything's been determined. Okay, well, and there's a lot we know that we can do as gardeners that can help, right, Max? Yes, uh, one of the things that I've noticed a lot is that a lot of people take the plants that we use there in the center as weeds, mm -hmm. and they end up destroying them, getting rid of them. I don't know how I many homes are out there with real nice turf, but no plants, no plants that the butterflies really need. Right, right. So choosing native plants that provide larval food, which means the caterpillars are going to chew them yes. down. Yes, and that's, that's one that um, <laughs> we've had some interesting stories about. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, um, ladies who create their own gardens come over to me and say, I want a, a, a plant that will attract a lot of butterflies. But then they come back to me and they say, look, it's blooming really nice, but these little worms keep eating it <laughs> and I destroy those worms but I never get any butterflies. <laughs> well, you destroy the caterpillar itself, you're not going to get your butterflies. Right. Well, you brought a few plants with you that we can use as kind of examples yes. of uh, things that provide uh, sustenance for the butterflies. Immediately next to me is American Beauty Berry. Now, I didn't know that this was a butterfly plant. Yes, it is. It actually serves as a, as a uh, berry for birds, mm -hmm. but when it does produce a very small flower, butterflies do love the nectar on that Okay, flower. so in, in springtime when they bloom, 
Uh, you can count on that. Now, now this r is a heliotrope. heliotrope. It looks like a little salvia here almost, but <laughs> uh, what's the common name for this one? That one's called, the, uh, they call it a scorpion's tail. Scorpion's tail. Well, I can see why they do that with the curved uh, and it's racing here. Little bitty flowers that right. some of the smallest butterflies love. Okay, so heliotrope is another native. And then we have a couple of vines over here. Uh, there's a passion vine, and I know the passion vines are favorite food for many species, right? Yes, the gold fritillary for one example, mm -hmm. and it, uh, zebra heliconians, mm -hmm. they love this, this particular vine, and it's one that you should have at home. Right, well, the passion vines are beautiful, yes. and they're great additions to the garden, but again, you gotta, when the caterpillars <laughs> come, Grin and bear it, right? Yes, yes. It's important. Well, there's some other things that people can do, and not just to put out food, but the, our use of pesticides and, and, and fungicides, things like that, right? Yes, we have a nursery at the National Butterfly Center. And of course, our mission is plant native and that the butterflies are connected to the plants. Uh, very intimately, you know, yes, certain course, caterpillars right. can only eat certain foods. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are buying those plants from a commercial grower, there's more and more in the news about those plants being treated um, with herbicides. And okay. those herbicides are designed to kill any weeds or native plant species mm -hmm. and to protect the plant from pests. Well, those worms or caterpillars are considered pests. Sure. So uh, we encourage everyone to buy local, to buy organic, to get to know your growers so that they can answer those questions about how the plants are treated, if at all, so that you're not growing plants that uh, not only don't attract mm -hmm. the pollinators, but actually harm them. Right. What about the use of genetically modified uh, crops? How is that impacting uh, butterflies? And we, we hear a lot about that. Well, the pollen from many of those plants has been altered, and butterflies are huge pollinators. Mm -hmm. Now, butterflies aren't going to go to corn, mm -hmm. but where those crops are growing and they're treated, um, all the weeds that might have grown up in those areas mm -hmm. are not going to be able to exist with those commercial crops. So uh, we're seeing a disappearance of native plant species as a result of all of the treatment of our, of our commercially grown crops. Well, you know, I know that our viewers here are gonna wanna do something positive about this. So the, the, the you know, re reduction of the chemicals, increase the use of the native plants. They can learn a lot about this at a festival that's coming up. Tell me about the festival. Well, the 18th annual Texas Butterfly Festival is in Mission, Texas, November 2nd through the 5th. And it's um, four days of field trips and excursions uh, to renowned public lands like mm -hmm. Santa Ana, as you mentioned, and private lands, which people may never get the chance to see. So people in our community who have incredible gardens or incredible grounds, and you're going with uh, world-renowned trip guides and leaders. Okay. And so you can... Uh, encouraged to come okay. and see the Rio Grande Valley. Okay, that's the 18th annual uh, Texas the, Butterfly Festival. November 2nd through 5th. Which is peak migration season. Mm -hmm. All right, well, really, uh, it's been a thrill visiting with both of you. I love the energy that you bring to this, and of course, this is a favorite topic for gardeners across the nation. Uh, continued luck, and be best wishes uh, for you. the National Butterfly Center in Mission, Thank Texas. Thank you. Thanks for being here, and coming up next is our friend Daphne. I'm Daphne Richards. Augie's taking a little time off this week to the vacation with his doxy cousins. Our question this week is from Marie, who's having some issues with her mandevilla plant. Her plant's in a large pot, getting full sun until about 2 in the afternoon. The leaves are yellowing and have some splotches, and some leaves are falling off. Well, Marie, there are definitely a few issues here that we can help with. First, the amount of sunlight. Mandevilla are tropical species, and although they, do, although they do need more sunlight than many tropicals, they still can't take the searing intensity of our sun here in Central Texas. And more importantly, they struggle in the moisture-sucking heat that comes with it. We have our Mandevilla in very bright shade in our demonstration garden, and they perform very well. Leaves grown in shade tend to be darker green, so give your plant a good shearing to remove those yellowing leaves and struggling growth after you've moved it to a shadier spot. Then watch for the new growth, which should be slightly darker. Some of the leaf damage here is sunburn, but most appears to be photooxidation. When sunlight is very intense, it can burn sensitive leaves, causing brown spots or sunburn. 
but before the leaf completely burns, you may notice yellowing leaves, which is a sign that the heat of the sun has denatured the chlorophyll. And since chlorophyll is a green pigment, less chlorophyll means less green. The smaller brown splotches here are likely secondary issues, possibly fungal, which move in once the plant is stressed and vulnerable. So Marie, move those containers to where they won't get direct sun any later than mid-morning and shear the plant to about six inches to force it to produce new, healthier growth. You'll see improvement in no time. Our plant this week is shoestring acacia, Acacia stenophylla. This strikingly unique tree is widely used in the desert southwest, not only for its beautiful form and weeping habit, but also because it thrives in extreme heat with very little water once established. As with the majority of southwestern species, this tree will not take kindly to poorly drained soils, so if you have heavy clay, you may want to choose another species. Schusting acacia grows 20 to 40 feet tall and will have a canopy about 15 feet wide. From a distance, it resembles a willow tree with very long, shoestring-like leaves. I could go off on an excited botanical tangent here about how the leaves are actually modified structures called phyllodes, but I'll spare you that plant nerd ramble for the moment. Shoestring acacia is a relatively fast-growing tree with all of the potential issues that come with it. It has a rather thin trunk and long, thin branches, leaving it more susceptible to breakage and wind damage. This tree is evergreen, and it's best used as an accent to enhance the beauty of your landscape. With its diffuse leaves and billowy habit, it provides very little shade. Shoestring acacia has a similar powder puff flower to other acacias, but you may hardly notice them amongst the graceful foliage. Although this tree can be virtually ignored once established, when you do water it, be sure to do so deeply and thoroughly, but not too much or too often, or it might develop root rot. Our viewer photo this week is from my very own garden. I snapped this cute little guy lounging on the sea of pink periwinkles in my backyard. And this week in your garden, if you're planning for some cool season vegetables, it's time to plant cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, garlic, kohlrabi, and many others. Also, we have a fruit tree seminar coming up in October. Check the extension website, travis-tx.tamu.edu for more information. We love to hear from you, so please visit us at klru.org ctg with your questions and plants from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Tricia Shirey. Homemade pickles are really delicious, but they require a lot of special canning equipment. You need jar lifters and special tongs. And it's hot work to be sterilizing jars and standing over a water bath canner for pickles. You can get the same delicious result by making refrigerator pickles when you're inundated with cucumbers from your garden or at the farmer's market. Now, to choose something to put them in, you can use jars, quart, pint, or even gallon jars, whatever you have room in your refrigerator for. You could also use plastic bowls or containers that have a tight lid. These are not vacuum sealed, so you can use any kind of jar uh, lid. It can be the two-part canning jar, but whatever can make a good seal. And then use any fresh, crisp cucumbers that you have. You can use a slicing cucumber, the burpless type, a pickling, or uh, just any kind of cucumber that you have. There's no need to peel the cucumbers for this. Just slice them thinly. You can use a mandolin or a food processor to slice them uh, more quickly. Wash your jars well, but the, you don't have to sterilize them. And then you can add different things to flavor the pickles to the jar. So I like to use a couple of cloves of garlic, some red pepper flakes, dill seed, peppercorns. You could put mustard seed and you can add peppers if you like a hot pickle. Now you can use any kind of pepper you like, jalapenos, serranos. If you slice the peppers, you'll get a really hot uh, vinegar. You can put the peppers in whole for just a slight flavor of pepper and then you can punch the peppers with a toothpick to give just a little bit more heat to your pickles. And you can check to see how, how much you like uh, of the heat in there. Now, uh, the dill, you hopefully save some fresh dill from your spring garden because usually the dill is gone before the cucumbers are ready. But you can buy fresh, really nice, fresh, fragrant dill seed too. Uh, for the vinegar, I like to use natural apple cider vinegar. You want to make sure it's made from apples because often it's white vinegar that's got caramel coloring and flavorings. 
Rice wine vinegar is also nice. They have a very mild flavor, so you really taste the pickles, not the vinegar. And you can add sugar to taste. Now, I usually just put a tablespoon or uh, less for a tablespoon for a quart jar, maybe half of that for a pint jar. Some people will put up to a cup in each jar, but that's too sweet for me. And you'll use a non-reactive pan to cook the brine. So you're going to heat the vinegar, the water, and, and d extra dill if you want that. I like a really dilly pickle, so I usually put dill in the brine. Heat that just to a boil, let it cool a bit, and then you're gonna put that over your sliced or, or uh, split cucumbers in the jar. Let it seal it up, let it cool for a little while before you put it in the refrigerator. And then the flavor is going to be great by the next day, but they'll actually keep getting more of the flavor as you uh, leave them in the refrigerator and they'll keep for several months. You can use the same technique for green beans, okra, cauliflowers, or for carrots. For more recipes on making icebox pickles and different things you can add, check out our website at klru.org ctg. And for Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shari. Thanks for joining us. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and like us on Facebook. Next week, Native American Seeds explains how to renew the butterflies. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.